Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's event, Challenges in the Horn of Africa, with our distinguished visitor, UN Special Envoy, Hannah Teta. I uh, want to welcome everyone who is in person, but also online, and all of our future viewers who will see this from its recording. Um, I'm Victoria Holt. I direct the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding here at Dartmouth. Uh, many of you know that the Dickey Center really embraces its founder's vision, which is that, as a former president of Dartmouth said, that the world's problems are our problems, and there's nothing that better humans working together cannot try to address. So it's really extra special that this theme not just be philosophical, but that we actually bring leaders to campus who try and do this in their day job. Um, and we're grateful that the reason we can do this is because the class of 1950 established a senior foreign affairs fellowship. And we're honored to use that to bring distinguished international actors and diplomats to campus. And it's their generosity. And I think they were also the first class to have John Sloan Dickey as their president through all four years. Many of you have come to prior lectures and may know that among the earlier speakers, we had Phil, Phil Zellico, a historian, a former diplomat, um, and also the chair of the 9-11 Commission, most recently launching the crisis COVID report um, and trying to think about how to prevent the next pandemic with our colleague, Kendall Hoyt. We've also had speakers, including Ambassador Bisa Williams, who now works for the Carter Center, trying to help for bring peace in the Sahel and spoke about her career as an American diplomat and previously former Deputy Secretary of State, William Burns, uh, also well known for mediation and, and diplomacy and today running the Center for International, I mean, CIA. So, but why does this matter? I think if you look around the world, we see a range of conflicts. Some we never hear about, others are on the front page on a regular basis. But diplomats behind the scenes are working to bring peace and justice and uh, outcomes that will prevent conflict and the harm to civilians. And that's a challenging job. Uh, for example, on the list, if you see Ukraine, Syria, and Ethiopia, you know around the world around 100 million people, broadly speaking, are displaced. And the predictions in Sudan is that 700,000 700, people, according to the UN, in just a little over a month have also been internally displaced. But the other side you see is positive change. If you can say that, coming out of the uh, war in Ukraine, uh, the UN and other diplomats have negotiated the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which has freed up tons of food to travel around the world, including to areas in the Horn of Africa. So this day job is very challenging, um, which is why I am so delighted that our speaker has joined us. Um, I'm, let me briefly introduce her, and then I will give her the podium. So uh, Special Envoy Hannah Teta was appointed by the UN Secretary General to her current role as the envoy for the Horn of Africa. So if you know what EGAD is, that's mostly those countries in that region. But she brings decades of experience to this position. She previously also served as a special representative of the Secretary General not to the African Union and also led the head, was the head of the UN office, not just the African Union, but in the region in Nairobi. Um, I first got to meet her, though, when she was the cabinet member in Ghana and, the former, and a foreign minister for her own nation of Ghana, uh, and quite a force to be reckoned with in the meetings I was in. <laughs> she has many other, uh, many other positions, has been a politician, and also has served on the Mediation Security Council for ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, including in trying to support peace in South Sudan. And she's also a lawyer. So with that, let me give the floor to the special envoy. Some remarks from you. We'll go to a question and answer bit, and then we'll open up to the audience. Please. Thank you very much, Tori. And I hope that you can all hear me. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And it's a pleasure to be with you here at Dartmouth. And thank you for inviting me. I want to start by telling you a bit about my mandate and my role. And I also would like to go into a bit more detail about in some of the countries where at the moment we have peace and security challenges. And after that, I'm very happy to take your questions. The Office of the Special Envoy to the Horn of Africa was established in 2018. And it had a mandate to sustain the gains made in the region on peace and security. Now, this was after we had seen the toppling of the Bashir government in Sudan and the historic transition that had taken place. There was hope for the ongoing peace process in South Sudan. 
there had been a democratic transition in Ethiopia, and things were looking positive. And then we had COVID. And while COVID did not directly link to some of the challenges that we're facing today, especially if you look at the Ethiopia situation, you can say that in a way it exacerbated it. Now, in addition to the positive stories, we have the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, which is IGAD, which covers the countries in the region that my office covers, which are namely Sudan, South Sudan, Eritrea, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, and Uganda. And my office has the mandate to work with this organization to see how we can mutually work together to be able to engage on peace building activities within the region. But it's not just an institutional partnership, it also involves engaging directly with the member states. And so I have a good office's mandate on behalf of the Secretary General, and um, my office has been tasked with enhancing linkages in the work of the UN system as a whole and other partners in the Horn of Africa region so that we can have a joined up approach to the peace and security challenges that exist. Now, this office had an earlier iteration where it was the office for the special representative to Sudan and South Sudan. And within the context of that mandate, um, what uh, the office was tasked to do was to support the African Union high-level implementation panel in its efforts to implement Security Council Resolution 2046 of 2012, in which Sudan and South Sudan were called upon to reach an agreement on the critical issues relating to the full implementation of the comprehensive peace agreement. So essentially to address those outstanding issues and make sure that they were dealt with. And this also includes the final settlement of the status of Abia. So that's just to give you an overview. But even though I'm going to talk about peace and security, I would like to emphasize the fact that this is an incredibly dynamic region. It is multi-ethnic, it is multicultural, it is multi-religious, it has such an important history that is an important contribution to the history of mankind that notwithstanding the fact that at the moment you see a number of crises, I don't want you to see the Horn only as a region of crisis. I want you to see the Horn as a region in transition. And as per what Tori said, how we as a collective can help to make those transitions a much more positive one than we have seen thus far. And I'll start with Ethiopia. I'll talk a bit about Sudan, South Sudan, and um, also uh, some of the developments within the Somali context. But Jim is here, and he's much more knowledgeable about that, given that he was the special representative to Somalia and head of ANSOM. So I'm not going to go into too much detail there. I think you have the opportunity to engage him on it. And I'll talk a bit also about climate change because the climate crisis is impacting the Horn of Africa very significantly. I would say that the greater Sahel region, which is the Sahel region in West Africa, spreading all the way to Sudan in East Africa, and that is the Horn, is really the part of the continent that is bearing the brunt of this transformation. And so we should see some of the tensions that exist also within the context of the impact on communities of climate change and understand that there is urgency in addressing the challenges of climate change, especially as regards the establishment of the fund on loss and damage as agreed in last year's COP and realizing it and making sure that it is available to help countries to adapt and build resilience towards the climate crisis. So within that context, let me start with Ethiopia. Now, I said everything was going well until COVID, and I would argue that the tensions in Ethiopia started with COVID. Because you, there was due to be an election in 2020, and it was postponed because of the COVID pandemic. Because at the beginning, we're not even sure whether it would be safe to hold elections in those circumstances. But the northern region of Tigray was of the view that the parliament the House of Representatives did not have the mandate to change the constitution, the time set in the constitution for holding elections. And so what they wanted to see was the elections held in 2020 
and they went ahead to hold regional elections at the time when the rest of the country postponed their elections. And after the elections had taken place, they indicated that they felt that they had legitimacy and the government did not. And that became the circumstances in which both sides were set for a showdown. Now, there was what is called a preemptive strike on a military facility in um, uh, Mikele that affected the Ethiopian National Defense Forces. And after that, as you could expect, the ENDF responded and they drove the TPLF out of Mekele and took over the Tigray region. But the Tigrayans came back with a guerrilla fight and by the July of 2021 had pushed the federal forces out of Mekele and then started progressing closer and closer to the capital Addis Ababa. Now, at that time, the African Union appointed former President Obasanjo as the special envoy for the Horn of Africa and tasked him with the responsibility of being the mediator for the conflict between the two sides. I would argue that he started using his best efforts to try to narrow the gaps between the two sides and get them to the table to have a mediation. But it was also the case that at some point in time, because of his engagements with the federal government, the Tigrayans lost confidence in him and refused initially to participate in an AU-led process. That led to a change in the dynamic and the establishment of a panel with President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta and former Vice President Fumzile Nguka of South Africa appointed as panel members in order to have to get a team that the TPLF would be ready to sit with in order to try to work with the Ethiopian government to resolve their differences. And this finally um, led to a peace process in Pretoria in October of last year and a peace agreement that was signed on the 2nd of November. Now, I could go into great detail on that, but I don't have the luxury of time. However, if in the course of the Q&A it comes up, I will be happy to elaborate. Suffice to say that a peace agreement has been signed, and now we are in the difficult process of implementation. And I say difficult process of implementation, not because there is not the commitment on both sides to implement it. On the contrary, I'm surprised at the progress that has been made over the last six months but difficult because there are still outstanding issues between Tigray and its neighbors when it comes to the regional boundaries. There are issues relating to disarmament, demobilization, reintegration that are yet to be resolved, not to mention that these are very expensive activities and the financial wherewithal to be able to conduct that is not, the, is not yet there. And there are also the issues of transitional justice and accountability for some of the atrocities that happened when I say some of the atrocities, it appears that some are more important than others. No, I'm just saying that in the course of a transitional justice mechanism, it's not always that every single abuse is investigated, prosecuted, and perpetrated and held accountable. But to the extent that it is possible to use a mechanism to achieve that, there is the difficult um, journey of transitional justice that is yet to be embarked upon. But the commitment of both sides so far has been to making it work. And there has also been further commitment on the part of the government to try to resolve another internal conflict with the Oromo region, which has seen uh, track two mediation processes start in Tanzania. They've currently gone on uh, a break, but both sides have indicated a willingness to continue those discussions. And it's important because the Oromo region and the Oromo population in Ethiopia is the largest population. And so to the extent that there are issues within that region that need to be resolved, they have the potential to create more destabilization than Tigray if they are not handled properly. But I am optimistic that because of the effort that is being put in place, we will see progress in that regard. Now, when it comes to um, the work of the UN, we are committed to support stabilization. Post-conflict reconstruction and recovery takes a long time. But there must be a peace dividend for the communities that were affected by the conflict. And together with my colleagues in the UN country team, both through OCHA, the humanitarian um, agency, through the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, through colleagues working with the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees, also with UNDP that is working on the 
DDR process, we all are working as one UN. But within our different particular mandates and leveraging our different strengths to make sure that we help this process of stabilization. I want to end the Ethiopia part of this discussion with something that struck me during the mediation process. When we went to South Africa, usually when you have, you are starting a mediation process, you have sides that are completely divergent and it's difficult to get them to come together to have direct talks. On the contrary, with the Ethiopians, they asked us to leave the room and they wanted to discuss with each other in Amharic. And the first two articles of the agreement where they stated the principles which would inform the rest of the agreement was negotiated directly by the two sides. And the fact that they were able to come to a consensus on that in two days, let us see that they clearly wanted to start this process of reconciliation and getting back together again. But up until that time, it had been really difficult for both sides to be ready to have those conversations. And it's because there was that willingness by the two sides to get together right from the start that I am optimistic that this process in its implementation will be successful. Now, let me move then to Sudan because it's in the headlines and unfortunately I can't say that there is such a, there, there is an immediate prospect for the end to the violence that is taking place in Khartoum. But that is not to say that there is a lack of effort. On the contrary, we're trying to do everything we can with whatever leverage we have to try to get to a ceasefire that will be respected. But we didn't get to the Sudanese situation overnight. If you would recall, after the overthrow of President Bashir, a civilian transitional government was established. And that government had the responsibility to take Sudan through the transition phase and then prepare towards elections where there would be a government with a specific mandate elected to continue on the path of transformation. But there were many civilian actors. There were the resistance committees, and the resistance committees were not necessarily networks of one organization. There were resistance committees that were formed in different suburbs of the city and different towns. And they all had one particular objective. They wanted to get rid of the Bashir regime, but they didn't have the leadership in the way in which an organized group would have had. And therefore, having clarity as to who those actors were was a major challenge. You had the Forces for Freedom and Change, which comprised of different political parties and political actors. You had the signatories to a follow-on agreement after the transition process started, the Juba Peace Agreement, who also had to be accommodated within the transitional government. So that multiplicity of civilian actors and getting to a consensus on the way forward was problematic. After about a year, when it seemed that some of these internal divisions between the civilian actors were creating difficulties for the transition process. The military took matters into their own hands, did a coup and um, removed Prime Minister Hamdok from office. As a result of international pressure, they were compelled to reinstate him. But Prime Minister Hamdok resigned shortly afterwards because, again, it was difficult for the, transition, for the civilian actors to come to a common purpose and common position. And so after that, you had the leadership of the Sovereign Council and attempts to negotiate another transitional agreement, which from the civilian aspect of it were quite successful. However, the military component of that agreement was a difficult challenge. There, was, there were provisions for security sector reform, initially thought to go on for about, um, to be undertaken over a 10 year period but there were elements within the Sudanese armed forces that wanted that to happen in a much shorter period. And ultimately, it is this disagreement between the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces of General Hermeti and their clash that has resulted in the conflict that you see today. And because this is between two military actors who see this as an ex existential threat for either of them, and there's this overwhelming need to overcome the other, even though it does not look like that is going to happen anytime soon.
it makes this particular situation more problematic. Now, I told Tori I was going to be 10 minutes in my um, initial remarks, and I can see that I'm going over that. <laughs> so what I will do is that I will talk briefly about South Sudan and even more briefly on climate, peace, and security, and then leave time for your, your questions. <clears throat> on South Sudan, when there was the negotiation for the revitalized agreement for the resolution of the conflict in South Sudan, I had not yet joined the UN, but I was one of the facilitators of that process. And what we tried to do was to not just have combatants in the room to negotiate the agreement, but this time to have a broader set of actors and stakeholders, including civil society, including women, including young people, including the private sector, so that there could be an agreement of which there was broader ownership and therefore broader support for its implementation. And the South Sudanese, over many years of negotiation with Sudan, I can tell you that they have perfected the art of negotiation. They are some of the most difficult customers when it comes to negotiating with them <laughs> on any issue. Because they, can, they, they have all kinds of tactics. They can drag things out. They can, you know, all of a sudden somebody can throw a tantrum and it's like the whole thing is about to disrupt. And then it starts all over again. So getting them to come to an agreement is not the easiest of situations. But getting them now to implement the agreement required more pressure because this was, in some instances, a disparate groups, combatants, people who really didn't like each other very much, who were being compelled to come together in a transitional government. And I think that one of the challenges with states where you have these peace agreements is that where you have fragile state institutions, the supporting institutions that would push people to keep moving in the implementation of these agreements are usually lacking. And so that's where the international community comes in and has the responsibility of taking the place of those institutions while at the same time in the context of the UN supporting to build those same institutions so that the South Sudanese people or the Sudanese people or the Ethiopian people can take on that for themselves because this is really their country, not ours. And our intervention is supposed to be temporary it is supposed to facilitate a process. It's not meant to create a permanent peace process or for that matter, a permanent peace mission. We should be looking within these contexts to make ourselves redundant, not to make ourselves permanent. And so with the South Sudanese process, unfortunately, a lot of the benchmarks for that were developed in the revitalized ARCIS program have not yet been met. It's important that we continue to encourage, to work with, to support, the um, finalization of the constitution, the preparations towards the elections, the completion of security sector reform, because without it, we are not going to be able to see that movement from a temporary transitional government to a government that has a clear mandate. And of course, when you have a government that has a clear mandate, that doesn't mean that everything has ended. It just means that now you are transferring responsibility and hopefully, the international community can gradually withdraw and the government can take over its responsibilities to its citizens. On the climate crisis, this is a disaster happening in plain sight. The amounts of rainfall that fall within certain areas of the Horn of Africa have reduced consistently over the last five years. In the area referred to as the Mandera Triangle between Kenya, Ethiopia and Somalia, the rainfall patterns consistently over the last five years have resulted in less and less rainfall. And so even with the best of intentions, people who live in this area will not be able to have the same livelihoods, especially when they are agricultural and pastoral communities. But there are solutions, but those solutions require finance in order to help to build resilience and also to support adaptation. And that's why, and I will end with this, that having the loss and damage fund that was agreed at the last COP implemented and having modalities for disbursement and working with well thought through projects, programs and initiatives to do exactly the work of adaptation and resilience is critical to enable these communities to survive in areas where they have lived for decades, in some cases for centuries. And if we don't do it, what is going to happen is that there are going to be increasing waves of migration
because people move in order to be able to survive. And that puts much more pressure on existing towns, cities, and other communities as there's more pressure on land, more contestation for access to water. And therefore, this is an accident that is not waiting to happen, it's happening. And the sooner that we begin to give it the necessary attention and support, it will be an important factor in reducing the tensions and conflicts, especially between communities within this region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I think you've given us just a small uh, bit of what you are actually deeply involved with. So before I dive into some of the, the regional issues you sketched, if you don't mind, a personal question. Okay. How did you become a diplomat? Well, that was a, uh, let me put it this way, it was political fortuity. <laughs> so in, um, when I, I, I'll go back a little bit, but not for too long. When I um, started my political career in the year 2000, I became a member of parliament. My party was in opposition. In 2008, I was director of communications for our national campaign, and because we won the election, I lobbied very hard for the job that I wanted, which was trade and industry, because I had worked in the private sector, I had practiced law in the private sector, and it was what I was most familiar and comfortable with. And after I'd done four years of trade and industry, I had a much greater appreciation of political risk mm. and international risk in economic development. And I also realized, because until then, I thought, until then I thought diplomacy was a bit frivolous. I also realized that it was actually a very serious matter and required the same degree of time and attention as any other, what I had previously considered more concrete area like administration of justice, like management of the economy, like trade and industry. And I had reprised my role as director of communications for the 2012 election, which we won. And so that allowed me to say, actually, this is the job I want in the next administration. <laughs> okay. And that's how come I, I managed to persuade President Mahama that um, uh, it would be a good idea to allow me to do this. Now, initially, there was a bit of resistance because we hadn't had a female minister of foreign affairs. As a matter of fact, we had, uh, I would say, a stand-in when we had a coup d'etat in 1979 when uh, our former President Rawlings came in for the first time as a military leader for a period of three months and he did what he called his house cleaning and he appointed a lady from the Foreign Office as Minister of Foreign Affairs but she actually didn't do anything, it was a placeholder. Hmm. And it had been a very, a position that was very male oriented. So when I said this was a job I wanted to do, there was a lot of, but she's not a diplomat. She hasn't been trained as a diplomat. She won't be able to do this, and it's going to be a challenge for her. And I was like, well, if I've managed to carry you through two elections, there's very little that I cannot do. <laughs> okay. So that's how I became a diplomat and Minister of Foreign Affairs. Very good. So you actually think there's a lot of transferable skills between your previous role in economics and trade and diplomacy? Oh, absolutely. So you said something interesting regarding Ethiopia, that you had a sense that things are going in the right direction. And one, one, you just mentioned that when the Ethiopians themselves took the lead on negotiations. I'd be curious in a broad sense as we keep talking about what that political will looks like to you, when you can sense it's in place, when you know when to nudge it forward, or when you think it's not working. Are there other tells or things that you look for It's very much in, you know, a lot of what you see about people when they're in a room together is body language. Mm. And those are not things that you will know and you will see as statements, but they're verbal cues. When without your prompting, they are ready to go across to each other, greet each other, mm -hmm. talk to each other, and nobody has to ask them to do that. When they start themselves asking the other side the question, why did you do this? Why did this happen? Why did it have to go that way? And what happened with the Ethiopia process in Pretoria was, you know, after we'd had the official opening of uh, the, the mediation process and as observers we were sitting at the back and you had the panel saying that this is the way in which we were going to lay this out. 
Once it was adjourned and you know, the, the, everybody got up from the room, immediately they started to head towards each other. Uh, right. You know? Yeah. And that, for me, was a surprise, because I thought people who had been fighting and really going at each other with such a vengeance, how would they, without any prompting, cross the room, go and talk to each other, and start asking themselves a question as to how did they get there? Mm. But before then, because after all, it took some assessment to determine whether or not the Pretoria process would work. After um, I had mentioned that the Tigrayans had pushed the federal forces out of Tigray in July, and they started coming downwards towards Addis. Around November of 2021, um, they were pushed back, and they retreated into Tigray, and there were these issues relating to humanitarian assistance, which with the assistance of the US envoy, um, David Satterfield, were resolved. And there were also issues of the restoration of basic services. In this case, electricity, the utilities, communication, and banking. And that had been an outstanding issue for a very long time. And the government kept saying they should renounce any intention to resume the conflict and we will restore services. But we need to have that statement before we go into a restoration of services. And then when we had the opportunity to go to, when I had the opportunity to go to Tigray with the US and the EU envoys, and we put that to them, they were like, no, we'd had a discussion. This is what they were supposed to do. We're not ready to do anything. And you could see that there was still this general militant attitude of, you owe it to us, you have to do this. Fast forward a couple of months later and the conflict resumed. But this time around, when you were engaging with the Tigrayans, you heard them saying, well, when is this process going to start? Hmm. So it was almost as if the resumption of conflict was more an act of desperation, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Than because they felt that their, their issues were not being addressed, than something that they had thought about and they believed that they were going to be able to, to take to the finish and win. And that's when I felt that there was the opportunity. So it was important to do everything possible to try and make these Pretoria talks happen. Mm -hmm. Because if they got into the room together, they, they probably would be the space to come to a conclusion or to, to reach an agreement. I thought it was going to take longer than it did. There were some parts of the process that I had issues with, but fundamentally the will was there to come to a deal. All right, well, fantastic. Um, and in contrast, you said that the, um, the warring party the, the, in, in Khartoum, both the, the government's military and the former rebel group, uh, see this as almost an existential fight, even though they came so close to signing everything but, as you described it, the, uh, the DDR program, the disarmament um, you know, reintegration program. How do you, what's your diplomatic sense tell you there about how easy it will be to get them back in the room. And if I can ask also, the consequences. Many of us have been reading about the actual fighting in Khartoum in suburbs, uh, people fleeing to Port Sudan, and fear that this could uh, spread across Sudan into Darfur and elsewhere, or even into the region. So uh, not maybe as easy a, a forecast that you could make, but give us a little sense of where you think this might go. I don't think it's easy at all, and I'm under no illusions that this is going to be resolved overnight. So the reason why I say this is I see this as a, something that both sides see as an existential threat. As far as the Sudanese armed forces are concerned, they've always seen the RSF as a rebel force that does not have the same status mm. as the Sudanese armed forces. And I think one of the challenges from their perspective is that after the initial um, transition agreement, there was a certain equivalence, which they don't accept. Yeah. Now, of course, no country is going to do very well if it has two armies. I mean, we saw the Ethiopia situation that I just spoke about, because each of the regions had their own special forces. If Tigray did not have special forces, it would have not attacked the um, ENDF, the Ethiopian National Defense Forces. 
And of course, if you have the RSF as well armed as they are, they will always be a significant threat within, especially when there's challenges with the power balance between the RSF and the South. Now, now that they've actually started fighting, the, and the kind of utterances that have come out from um, senior leaders of SAF regarding the RSF and seeing them as a rebel group that need to be brought under control or annihilated, and the only conversation they are ready to have is a negotiation as to how they get to be integrated into the Sudanese armed forces. I mean, they've taken maximalist positions. And from the perspective of the RSF, General Hemeti, who is the leader of the RSF, is a very ambitious man. Hmm. I think that he also has presidential ambitions himself at some point in time. And indeed, was, I believe he was championing the cause of the transition and was seen by the civilians to be an ally. But even though he did that because it was um, opportune for him to do so, I think he had it with his own political ends in mind. Mm -hmm. So, but it doesn't look that either side is going to be able to win this conflict. If they were, if the SAF had the kind of strength that they say they have, they should have finished, them, the, the, finished this by now. Instead, you have a situation where RSF has a stronger position in Khartoum, hmm. at least, and that's the reporting I, 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 I'm aware of, than the Sudanese armed forces. And so that's why the pressure now has to be on towards a ceasefire. Because if there isn't a ceasefire, this can go on for a very long time. And even without a ceasefire, one of the things that uh, colleagues within the humanitarian space are trying to, trying to do is to negotiate safe corridors for humanitarian assistance. Mm -hmm. Because that does not need to wait for a ceasefire. But certainly the communities that are impacted in Khartoum and other cities need that kind of relief now. But I'm under no illusions that this is going to be something that either side will easily agree to. And there will need to be a lot more pressure to get them to that point of let's have a durable ceasefire that creates the conditions for discussions on other issues as well. And what are the best sources of that pressure? Are these uh, some of the groups that, that fought for democracy in the first place? Are these the neighbors or larger region? Is it the African Union? There will have to be a multiple, multiplicity of actors. Now, this um, transition process was negotiated under the auspices of what we call the tripartite mechanism between the African Union, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, and the United Nations. And so my colleague, who is the special representative for Sudan and the head of UNITAMS. Um, Why don't you tell us what UNITAMS is? UNITAMS mm -hmm. is the UN um, transitional mission in, in Sudan. And uh, he's called Volker Perthes, has been very much at the forefront of working on this with uh, Ambassador Ismail Wais from IGAD and uh, previously Professor Labat, who is the chief of staff of the chairperson, and later on um, Ambassador Belesh from the African Union to get to this transitional agreement. And I think that we need to continue to use that mechanism. But though the discussion on a ceasefire is now happening, with the two combatants. I think sooner rather than later and as quickly as possible, the civilians have to be brought back into this discussion because Sudan is not just about these two um, warring generals. Sudan is bigger yeah. than these two warring generals. There was the transition in the first place because there was a revolution led by civilians. They were brave enough to continue to demonstrate even though they knew that for many of them it was going to be um, with, very, with very likely, and indeed there was, personal consequences that in some cases put their lives at risk. And I think that it's not appropriate to ignore that sacrifice and that desire for democratic change. And so if we make this just a conversation between the two generals, even though at this stage for this ceasefire it's important, I think that we would not be we would, we would have broken faith with the people of Sudan. All right, thank you. I have one more short question and then I'm gonna to turn to all of you. Uh, climate change. Yeah. So, very broad point, but I wanna give you a little more room to get into it if that's possible. 
uh, both the effects of it and then maybe what, in addition to what you talked about with loss and damage, uh, could be done to basically try and either mitigate or build resilience? So many of the countries in the Horn are within the LDC category, right? Which means that they do and not- And LDC is? Least developed <laughs> countries, sorry. Uh, within the LDC category and therefore they do not have adequate public resources to deal with some of these medium to long term capital investments themselves. But it's important that these medium to long term capital investments are made in adaptation and resilience if they are going to, if those spaces are going to continue to be habitable. And that's the reason why I zeroed in on the loss and damage fund because it's one of the mechanisms that has been agreed for that, pro for that process. If you look at Somalia, and you look at some of the, the extremes of both drought and flooding that take place in different parts of the country, depending on what season and what time it is. All of this effectively disrupts agricultural production. And these countries, most of their economies are based on agriculture. And not irrigated agriculture, rain-fed agriculture, mm -hmm. where it is there. And of course, it's also important for maintaining existing waterways and, and, and access to, to water resources. And so what we've seen over the last, again, five years where you've seen this extreme drought condition continuing to repeat itself, is that there have been loss of livelihoods. Mm -hmm. There has been, in some instances, migration of communities, and they've become internally displaced communities elsewhere, again, simply because they don't have the options. And then you've had governments that have tried to respond. The Ethiopians, for instance, have the green initiative where they've been planting trees for this last four years to begin to reverse some of the impacts of climate change. But trees take a while to grow. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so even if you, you, you have initiatives like that, you're not going to get the impact immediately. And that's the reason why, though there are in Kenya, in Ethiopia, in Uganda, in Somalia as well, initiatives to try to reverse the impact of climate change by virtue of the fact that these by themselves are medium term initiatives, mm -hmm. right? They need to have medium to long term attention. We cannot treat this as a one off and you don't resolve these situations by sending water tanks to communities. Right. Right? Right. Because of course the person who has the water tank is probably going to make some money. The, person who gets whatever contract is there to do this, because usually you would take contractors internally to provide some of these food solutions and all of that, they, they'll get something out of it. But that's not the way in which we should be looking to solve this. Very good, all right, big thinking with huge impacts. All right, let me turn to our audience here. I see a few hands already. If you don't mind, introduce yourself and uh, the microphone is coming over here. Thanks, Judith. Thank you very much. My name is Felix Davis. Um, I'm a computer science and economics major. If you don't mind speaking into the microphone so we can hear you. Please. Hello. There we go. <laughs> All right, yeah. my name is Felix Davis and I'm a computer science and economics uh, ma double major here. Um, I have several questions, but I would ask just two. And yeah, first of all, thank you very much for what you do. My first question is that um, I learned recently that mobilization is expensive. War is expensive. And if most of these least developed countries have very fundamental problems, um, you have a lot of insight into where their funding comes from. And then you mentioned leverage. Does the UN or the international community have any leverage as to where this source of funding is? And is there anything being done um, about that? Then the second question I have is, um, I learned also recently that one of the main reasons, getting insights into what happened in South Africa during apartheid, I learned that one of the major, you know, problems of bringing two factions together is when one starts thinking of the consequences of actions that they had committed in the past. So if one general is scared of going to prison, assuming um, um, peace is, is agreed upon, or so I'm, I'm just wondering, is, is there any play of any of these things happening in trying to you know, like put these two parties together? Is anyone worried of, of, of the repercussions that come from agreeing to, um, um, to, to the terms of conditions that you have proposed? Fantastic questions, thank you so much. Uh, why don't I have you take those just to get started? So yes, war takes money, buying weapons takes money. 
And that's the reason why you see a lot of conflict associated with the criminal economy, right? You see human trafficking, where there are natural resources. You see ex within the areas or under control by particular armed factions. You see them exploiting those natural resources, especially when it comes to minerals like gold, all right? And then you also, you also see a lot of other illicit uh, illegal activity that essentially allows them to finance, their, to finance their, their enterprise. But in the case of the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces, they have also been um, involved in the conflict in Yemen. And they were contracted um, to be able to provide uh, support in that conflict. And therefore, they have, as it were, outsourced their services for a fee. And so the question is, what do we do when we see this kind of situation? Because it does have significant implications when they now come back to be a major force and can wreak havoc in, in other particular contexts. Within all of the situations in which we find ourselves where we, we, we have this activity, we have a certain, at the UN, I would say a limited toolbox. And I would say a limited toolbox because we use sanctions. At the same time, we try to, as it were, create the vehicles for accountability. But in a fluid situation, it's difficult to apply those things. And so we don't have as much success, I think, as we would have liked to have. And sometimes s s sanctions are a blunt tool because they don't only impact combatants, but they also impact the broader society. And it's a conundrum. Sometimes it is actually member states of the UN that have more leverage when they, they impose individual sanctions, because this then targets specific persons and the assets can be at risk. And um, it doesn't give them the opportunity to travel as much, but there's still a lot of vehicles for illicit financial flows and for managing dirty money. And we haven't found enough mechanisms to effectively deal with that, to be quite honest with you. Now, when it comes to issues of criminal accountability, again, unfortunately, if you look at the Horn of Africa region, there are people who have been sanctioned for a while. They haven't left their countries. And in their countries, they're not being held accountable. And so as far as they see it, yeah, they've, they've, we've said, they would say, in the South Sudanese context, they would say, well, you've done your worst. I'm still standing. Um, for as long as I, I'm, I'm still within this space, I'm fine. And who says I want to travel into the Western world anyway? Mm -hmm. And now there are other countries where they are able to hide their illicitly um, gotten gains. And so it's not as if they're looking to put their money in banks in Switzerland and you know, other places, which was previously the case. So it's dealing with these challenges of people who have created havoc, who ought to be held accountable, where we have limits as to the tools we have and they are not that effective. Those are things that require a lot more attention. I mean, the ICC as a mechanism was created to be able to deal with some of these, these issues. But even then, we know that it has not been able to be as effective as, again, one would have wished. So it is something that we need to look at much more closely in order to be effective. But where it is possible to bring people to account, we should not hesitate to do so. And remember that there's no statute of limitations on crime. So the fact that someone is not held accountable today doesn't mean that that's a permanent situation. All right, well, thank you. I think I see Pia. Uh, thank you. My name is Piok Teng. I'm a second year student here at Dartmouth, majoring in economics and government. I'm um, from South Sudan. Um, so I wanted to ask two things. Um, first, it's your prediction about the peace agreement in South Sudan, the referralized peace agreement. Um, uh, what I've seen, uh, I think, according to my observation, is that uh, the government, uh, what they have kind of done with the SPLM IO and the SPLM, uh, they've kind of made some little progress uh, in terms of the security arrangements. But they, I keep hearing this complaint from them is that uh, the, the sanctions, specifically the arms embargo, has been the biggest issue now. Uh, 
I also see some truth to that because one of the major problems that I see now in South Sudan is intercommunal violence and the government's lack of capacity to respond uh, militarily or anything and uh, the widespread uh, spread of arms in the hands of civilians. So what do you see next year? Because uh, there's supposed to be an election next year, 2024, which was pushed from, from last year. Um, what is your prediction? What will happen on that, on, on the implementation of the, pre, of the peace? But also, I want to uh, also ask you about the climate thing uh, in South Sudan. Uh, there's a lot of flooding there, uh, different from Somalia, which is drought. Yeah. Um, how much of that do you think is climate induced? And um, how much of that uh, is just a, a repetition of what happens across that area of the Nile? But also, how can South Sudan uh, increase its re resilience towards these things? Because uh, being from there, I know there's a, a, a deep lack of infrastructure and all that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So on your issue of um, lifting, the, the, lifting the sanctions, especially the arms embargo, I don't think it should be lifted. And I'll tell you why. It doesn't seem to me that people have a problem buying guns in South Sudan. As you said, there is widespread possession of weapons by civilians. And in South Sudan, you can't bring those kind of weapons into the country without some facilitation, right? So when you look at that whole trail and how that comes to be, I think it makes the case for not immediately lifting the arms embargo. On the contrary, what I think we should be emphasizing and what I know my colleagues in ANMIS are looking at is to make sure that those existing structures that prevent that should be strengthened. And then you can talk about maybe some time to come lifting the arms embargo. But in the here and now, I think you'd be doing more harm than good. Though I accept the government's point that it is important for them to be able to properly equip the necessary unified forces as a result of the security sector reform that is taking place. But even under the context of arms embargoes, there have always been some exceptions given particular context, and that has happened a number of times within the Somali context. So if really there was sufficient evidence to show that um, the government really needed these weapons and was incapable of getting them from any other source, and this was a legitimate use of, of force and they needed to have that kind of, of equipment, they would be able to get it with exceptions under the arms embargo. So the lifting is not exactly, I think, the most important element over here. Now, do I think there's going to be elections? I wish there would be. But elections take time to prepare. And so the question really is what happens over the next year towards preparations for the elections? And if, in earnest, the government empowers existing institutions with the support of the UN and other actors to arrange elections, there will be. But it requires more work done on the constitutional project. They have to fi finish drafting their, their constitution because after all, that's the frame within which this contest is going to take place. They have to complete their security sector reform, not necessarily as a prerequisite, but it would be a good stop to have that done before you have um, a transition to an elected government with a clear mandate and not having to come on board with that kind of baggage. And then, necessarily, there has to be an effort to stabilize the rest of the country. Because right now, if you were going to campaign in the different parts of South Sudan and you did not come from that particular region, I'm guessing that you have quite a, some problem in, in doing that and you'd be worried about your safety and security. And part of creating the conditions for a free and fair election is to have stability across um, the different regions of the country. On your issue relating to flooding, yes, I do think flooding is related to climate change. Very much so. And given that in some places, for instance, in Unity State, and you would know better than I, the flooding has not receded over a year, I think it is fair to say that it's unlikely that people can stay in those places again. So it comes back to the issue of internally displaced persons and creating new homes for them.
or new settlements for them so that they can make their livings elsewhere. And that's part of what we're having to deal with as responding to the crisis, even though the examples I gave initially were referring to droughts. Very good, thank you. Uh, I see you did right behind you, the young woman. Hello, <laughs> uh, my name is Rowan. I'm a first year as well. Um, but I'm more so curious in terms of like the, pl the plans of the UN in, um, intervention um, efforts with displaced Sudanese people. Um, and I guess who or if or who deals with um, in communication with Egypt in terms of like if conflicts will, would arise from an influx of Sudanese people in Egypt or Ethiopia. Are so, you talking about the dam conflict in particular? No, I'm sorry, like displaced folks. Displaced. And, displaced. Yeah. So in each of these countries, we have UN country teams. Maybe explain that. The UN, even though it is, you know it as the UN and you see the symbol and the blue flag, there are many different parts of the UN. And there are many other organizations that are part of the UN system. And each of these are specialized organizations that deal with different challenges. And so a UN country team is made up of representatives of these different organizations so that those capacities exist in country to be able to provide support when necessary. Now, in practically all of the countries of the Horn, we do have the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees because there are high levels of internal displacement. There are also high levels of movement across borders as a result of conflicts that have taken place before. You have the um, Office of the Coordinator for Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA. They deal more with, in, with internally displaced persons, but they're also responsible for providing humanitarian assistance. And then within these organizations, we have country offices, but we also have sub-regional and regional offices. So for instance, where we have a major crisis, as we have right now within the Horn, because of these movements as a result of the Sudan conflict and people moving across, fleeing across borders in order to be safe. What happens is that these key organizations, OHCHR and OCHA and IOM, the International Organization for Migration, are watching these flows. And they are, if you like, the first responders when it comes to the provision of humanitarian assistance and helping people to settle in IDP or refugee camps. And they keep tab on the numbers and they, of course, they raise resources to be able to provide the support. And they also help to repatriate when there is the opportunity to do so. So they work very much with the national authorities. It's not a standalone intervention. They work in support of national authorities to be able to do this, but they keep track of the numbers and the people that we're talking about in order to be able to make sure that we can respond effectively. She was asking about Egypt in particular. Was there any connection there? Well, uh, the answer I've given you is general, but yeah. it, it applies in Egypt, it applies in Ethiopia, it applies in South Sudan, it applies in Chad. It applies to all the neighbors of South Sudan because people have been moving, depending on which is the closest border, people have been moving out. A lot have moved north towards Egypt, right? And the Egyptian authorities have not necessarily always been welcoming because there's been some, th that's not to say that they haven't allowed people in, but there have been long queues at the border. And so crossing has been something of a challenge. But on both sides, you have UN agencies who are doing their best to support national authorities to respond. But have you heard of particular instances in Egypt that gave rise to your question? I mean, I was having a conversation with someone the other day about what would happen, like, you know, when there's an influx of people, right, in a new country, like, what could happen, like, who's welcoming them, um, if they're welcoming them, and what happens then when there's, like, a specific community where there's going to be a lot of Sudanese people in there, and who's supporting them, um, or if there's any, like, opposition to that. In that certain community. That makes sense. And also, I was going to ask about the damn situation if there's <laughs> much to do about it. So, what, I mean, generally what happens, as I said, in all of these countries, there have been movements of people in and out for a while as refugees as a result of conflict and other reasons for displacement. Climate change can also be a reason for people to be displaced from where they are and to move into another country or a different part of their own country. 
So as I said, wherever that has happened, each country has its own, if you like, national disaster management organization, whatever it's called. It differs from state to state. And usually these organizations that are responsible nationally to deal with these crises are the organizations the UN agencies work with in order to be able to respond. And so that's something that is a basic part of, of the work that we do. Now on the dam, as you know, the GERD has been in development for the last, when I say development, that's not the right way of putting it. The filling of the GERD has taken place over the last four or five years. And we are getting to the end of that process. It is a fair accompli. And what I mean by that is that there's no way you're going to be able to unplug that water <laughs> without causing a huge amount of damage. But the issues between Egypt and Ethiopia remain. And the issues, as I understand them, and I say Egypt and Ethiopia because it's more between Egypt and Ethiopia than be with Sudan. Sudan has a pass-through effect, right? And as a matter of fact, the way in which the construction of the dam allows for a steadier flow and management of flooding within Sudan. So it's more of an opportunity for them than anything else. But for Egypt, they're worried about their access to water and maintaining the same levels of water coming from the Nile. And that is a contentious issue. So far, there has not been a drop in the level of water available to Egypt, which is the reason why I think situ the situation has not escalated. But if further development was to take place that impacted Egypt's water supply, it would then become a significant matter. Having said that, there had been technical discussions between all three countries that were being facilitated by the United Arab Emirates and with support from UNEP. And United Arab Emirates did this with the endorsement, as it were, of the African Union, because they initially agreed on an AU process to try to see how they would work out their differences in that regard. It hasn't really brought any outcomes that have resolved the fundamental differences, but for that reason, it's still a work in progress. Um. Uh, I, my name is Lily, I'm a first year student here at Dartmouth, and I was going to ask if you could touch a little bit on Eritrea, because that's a conversation that's often left out of the Horn of Africa discussion, just because it's not an active crisis, whereas it's more of a situation of protracted crisis and protracted displacement. Um, but obviously, with the recent Tigrayan War, where reports that a lot of the major war crimes have actually been committed by Eritrean troops in contrast to this notion of the peace process between Eritrea and Ethiopia, how that has sort of impacted things and what the UN's stance on this is because it often seems that the international community is sort of just waiting for Afwerki to pass away. But realistically speaking, there might just be a fill-in after that and what the UN's stance has been. Well, with Ethiopia, after the peace agreement was signed, one of the one of the conditions of the cessation of hostilities agreement was that all forces would withdraw from Tigray, and that has happened. So as at now, from the reports that we have, there are no Eritrean forces in Tigray, though I agree with you that they were part of the conflict. I also mentioned, I think, in my remarks that we have a transitional justice policy in progress, and there will be a transitional justice mechanism, and a lot of the people who have been victims of sexual violence in conflict have, have alleged that a lot of those perpetrators were actually Eritrean. The important thing is to have a process that allows those allegations to be substantiated. And that's going to be the difficult part, quite frankly, of this transitional justice process. I'm not saying that because we've got this happening automatically, it leads to a good outcome. But Accountability is through justice mechanisms, right? And so as the international community, as the UN, our job is to make sure that we support the countries to make those as strong as possible and effective in order to be able to hold people to account. Now, the engagement with Eritrea within the Horn is challenging for the UN and other actors, sometimes because you have in the you have a government that doesn't really want to engage the international community, right? President Isaias himself hardly travels. You can count the number of times he's been out of his country over the last five years. So it's not as if you're going to have the opportunity 
to meet with him anywhere else. He doesn't really take phone calls. <laughs> he will say that the discussions should be, it's been reported that he insists that discussions should be in person. And when you want to travel to his country, he may or may not issue you with a visa. And there have been many of my colleagues, and myself included, who have tried to visit um, Eritrea and have not been given the opportunity to do so. So it makes dealing with, with, with a government like that incredibly difficult, because you need to have a partner to engage. Now, notwithstanding, the UN, the development side of the house, has been able to have some impact in Eritrea. Most recently, the head of UNDP, Akim Steiner, paid a visit to Eritrea. And um, while we may not be able to engage on the political peace and security side for now, that's not to say that we're going to, or we have abandoned the thinking that it's important to do so. It's just more an issue of the means to be able to do so and to engage effectively. But Eritrea is coming back into EGAD, and maybe that might be another opportunity to try and engage them on a number of issues in which they have influence in the region. Very good. All right. I see Babette. Hi, thank you so much. Um, today we've talked a lot about conflict resolution or you know, even just stabilization, but I'm also really interested in your thoughts on conflict prevention and what in your career, what have you seen as the most valuable tools that the UN or the AU or other international actors have in stopping conflicts before they break out? And kind of where do you think there's the most room for progress to be made there? Thank you. Well, that's where the good office's mandate really comes in, right? Because that gives you the opportunity to engage before something happens, as opposed to after the event. But the thing with the good office's mandate and prevention is that you don't advertise it, right? So very often, people don't realize the work that is done simply to make sure that everything doesn't fall off the cliff. And it's not necessary for it to be projected in that way because I think that would, may have an impact on its effectiveness. But a lot of the work that colleagues do on political analysis to understand developments in a particular context, to raise the red flags and to give early warning, are uh, exactly that. Early warning is supposed to lead to early action. And so when you recognize that these are things that are likely to occur, then you have a responsibility to engage the parties and to do what you can to make sure that it doesn't. Now, when you can do that with individual leaders, that's the, I wouldn't say the simpler way of doing it, but let's say that doesn't, does, doesn't require the same amount of effort. But when these are intercommunity disputes, when there are many root causes to a situation, then sometimes it's not just an office like mine, but working with people within the country team, again, within the human rights space, within the humanitarian assistance space, within the development space, to try and give some solutions that would prevent an escalation of tensions and conflict. So you deal with it in different contexts, in different ways. But the most important thing is to take that early warning. And right now, a number of the regions, and certainly within the Horn, IGAD has an early warning system where they literally are on a daily basis giving out, sending out these and you know, it's at every morning at 8 a.m. They literally give you a readout of where you have all of these tensions developing and where you see that these problems are likely to emerge and therefore give you the opportunity to take action. It's, uh, it, it, it is, sometimes it is difficult because you see resistance beginning to build, especially where there are tensions that exist between communities or political actors. But it's still, I think, the more effective tool we have because it's more cost effective, surely, than having to deal with the aftermath of a crisis. Are there any things that you can now talk to us about that you think have been like moments of pride for you or where you really felt like you made a difference? In South Sudan, the revitalized ARSIS. Because, you know, that agreement is now in place. But I remember when I, we were three facilitators, and so we took it in turns to chair 
and to coordinate the process because three of us at the same time would be difficult. And, you know, there were a number of, of young women in the, in the room at the time when we were negotiating this because we had representatives from different stakeholder groups. And they wanted to raise issues regarding sexual violence and conflict. And I gave the opportunity to one of them to make the argument and another of the government representatives said, you know, this isn't an issue when this happens and any of the forces do those kind of acts. Well, I mean, they are tried and they are convicted, so this is not something to discuss here. And you, do, you could see from the reaction of other young ladies who were still in the room that, of course, they were not buying that argument. And I remember I told him that if they indeed were being tried and convicted, everybody would know about it because it is such a critical issue. And so, no, I don't believe they're being tried and convicted. And that's the reason why this has to be in this agreement. And there must be accountability for that because women's bodies cannot just be treated as the spoils of war. And I could see that they all started smiling very broadly when they heard me, they heard me say that. And whenever they wanted to raise a point that was specific to the challenges that women were facing, I'd always create the space for them to be able to do so in the course of that particular, that particular session. And when the day had ended and we had left and I, you know, I was getting out of the hall, I had running behind me and I was wondering what happened. I turned around and this young lady crashed into me, you know, <laughs> and gave me this really big hug and she said, thank you, you know. And the way she said thank you and the way she was so excited, I mean, I was doing it because I felt it was the right thing to do, right? But to see that for her and for her colleagues who were with her in the process, it meant so much. Even though we hadn't finished the negotiation of the agreement, that was, that was satisfying. That made the arguments I was having with the government side worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately. Well, um, I do need to draw this to close shortly, but you know, you're in a, in a, in a a college, a university, a lot of research and understanding of, of the world's issues conducted here. What would you recommend to those of us more in the research or uh, study mode? Things that you see coming at us that could, that could benefit from attention. Uh, while we were talking earlier, you mentioned, you know, war is not just conducted in, in real time anymore. It's conducted online. It's conducted yes. through social media and that the lack of guardrails for that could actually be a problem worldwide. So I just wanted to give you a chance to kind of reflect back to us what you see coming and what uh, a school like Dartmouth could maybe play a role in helping address. Well, and the, the Secretary General has a new agenda for peace, and I think a digital agenda for peace has to be an important part of that, that work. And the reason why I say so is because if you look at the Ethiopian crisis or you look at what's happening now in Sudan or you look at any of these developments, you see that there is so much that happens online, especially the contribution sometimes of diaspora communities, as well as communities in the country. But in all of these countries, internet penetration is not that high. So even though you do have people who are active online, actually the more active persons are within the diaspora. And sometimes the amount of misinformation that is peddled and the kind of things that they say and the impact it has on communities at home because it migrates from digital platforms into mainstream news. And then once it gets into mainstream news on radio or on television or on YouTube and other, then it, it's almost taken as fact. And so increasingly we're seeing just how much harm is done and how much tension is stoked in the digital space that that gets translated into the physical world and you see the way in which it affects how people engage with each other. So we can't neglect the digital arena. And I think a lot more research on how we manage that, how we protect against that, how, we, how the social media platforms recognize that their responsibility goes beyond you know, hiring people to try and pick out a couple of videos and, and by that they say they're doing their job. Once the platform exists and it's utilized, I think they have a greater responsibility. But not only to make sure that that kind of speech doesn't find its way mm 
or is kept on those platforms, but also for the people who actually do the work of identifying that and removing it. Because a lot of that is actually still done by people, especially where the languages are not that well known and haven't been translated. And, and you, know, you have the tools to be able to do those translations, again, on digital platforms. Many African languages are not written. They are oral. And, and to the extent that because of that, it's about what people say and what people say on audio or on video and how that gets interpreted and the harm that it does, I think we need to have a broader look on how we deal with these issues. Wow. All right. Well, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Special Envoy Sadat. <laughs>